Um, Don is a, 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 a Don Wildling well-known um, author, historian. This is his the third book um, that local folks have, uh, have read and enjoyed. And um, um, we're just thrilled to have him to, here today. Um, you all know him, so I don't need to tell you about him. And I'm just going to let him start talking instead of me. So I introduce Don Wildling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, yeah, I bring you uh, information from the other end of the Cape uh, on shipwrecks of Cape Cod. My third book, as mentioned, um, this is uh, this book looks at 43 different maritime disasters that occurred uh, off of Cape Cod. Uh, that's really not a lot, actually, when uh, you look at it. There were, during uh, the early 16th century, uh, 1600s, I should say, and the mid 20th century, you had anywhere between 3,000 and 4,000 shipwrecks. And this is just a very, very rough estimate. Nobody's completely sure as to how many there really, really were. Um, so just along that 40 mile stretch of Outer Beach, a lot of this was going on. And I, I do. Uh, I do uh, stray away from the Outer Beach a little bit in this book, but not too much. Uh, but it's also been said, with all these wrecks, it's been said that if you uh, raised all the wrecks between Provincetown and Chatham, uh, that wreck there within that 350 so year or so stretch, you could walk from Provincetown to Chatham without getting your feet wet. Oh, wow. That just gives you an idea of how many, uh, the wrecks, just how bad it really was. Uh, <clears throat> I start off things, because a lot of the documented wrecks, most of them were um, between uh, 16, 1626 and 1984 is where I go uh, with all this. But actually, the first shipwreck was very nearly the Mayflower. When the Mayflower came across the ocean, it didn't just sail straight from England to Plymouth Rock, as everybody. We, a lot of us know the story of how it ended up in Provincetown and the uh, pilgrims explored the Outer Cape. But when the Mayflower was first coming across the Atlantic, it was far north of its projected route. It had been blown off course and uh, by storms and everything. And the first land that actually saw was East Ham. So they knew they had to turn south very quickly. And they didn't get very far. They almost uh, hit the shoals at Monomoy, right off of uh, what is now Chatham. Mm. And from there, that's when they turned around. And they actually had old maps uh, that, were, that were charted only a few years earlier by none other than Captain John Smith that's another story, because he explored out there, too. That's when they anchored in Provincetown Harbor and explored and then went on to Plymouth. So first one came a few years later, actually, was the Sparrow Hawk. You may have heard of that one in 1626. Stranded on uh, Pleasant Bay in, in, uh, on Nausic Beach in Orleans. And this is where it all starts, and that's where my story ends, too, with the LDA in 1984. Those two ships were... Uh, the wrecks occurred not more than maybe 100 yards apart, if that. So it was, uh, the Sparrowhawk started things off. This was actually, this crew was also headed for points south, and, and, uh, but they, uh, they were wrecked in Orleans. They actually were assisted by the local natives, who eventually got them to Plymouth, and then the following spring they were, uh, they were, they were able to get to their points, uh, their destination to the south. Also, the Somerset in uh, 1778 in Provincetown uh, was basically terrorizing towns all along the East Coast, particularly Boston, uh, mentioned in uh, Longfellow, Longfellow's poem. And the Somerset actually met its end when it was chasing a French vessel off of the back of Provincetown in a storm. And the people of Provincetown, a lot of them were up on uh, High Pole Hill, which is where the monument is now. Yeah. And they were watching what was going on. They could see this chase going on. Mm -hmm. And the Somerset 
met its end the way so many of these shipwrecks did. Crashed into one of the sandbars just offshore. Uh, that's how a lot of them, uh, a lot of these wrecks uh, happened. And a lot of prisoners were taken. Uh, 480 men were on board. 20 of them, over 20 died uh, during the initial collision. Wow. And these prisoners were all marched to Boston. Uh, and the Sparrowhawk remains were later uncovered in 1863, and they've been on display in various places ever since then. I think they're at Plymouth now. And the Somerset remains were exposed in 1886 in Provincetown, and some of them are now at the Pilgrim Monument. Also in 1973, and again in 2012. So this is how much the sand comes and goes, it shifts. And, covers things up and buries them again very quickly. Um, also with these two ships from the timbers, uh, were, a few canes were made and were circulating on the Cape for quite a long time. I think it was into the 1900s that maybe some of those canes were all around. Um, Donald McMillan, who McMillan Pier is named for in Provincetown, he once noted that Benjamin Franklin was the first to notice the dangers inherent in the troubled waters of Cape Cod, and through these efforts, they started to see the need for lighthouses. And the first one, of course, was Highland Light, 1797. It's had a few versions since then. Um, also, uh, you had two lighthouses later in Chatham, and then the Three Sisters in East Ham. And on top of that, you also had Race Point in Provincetown as well. So they, they started establishing all these lighthouses. wasn't enough. wasn't nearly enough. You started having all these um, tragedies happening. One of the most, uh, one of the worst was the Truro Gale or October Gale of 1841. Fifty-seven men from the town of Truro alone perished at sea during this storm. Yeah. It became known as uh, Truro actually took on the name of Dangerfield to a, by a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, Truro was uh, one of the towns that faced a lot of trage tragedy. Uh, Dennis lost 26 men, 10 from Yarmouth, 18 vessels from Harwich were wrecked, and between Truro and Chatham, more than 40 vessels ran aground and 50 bodies washed ashore. Yeah. So this was a quite a tragedy uh, just from the one storm alone, and there were many more that were like this. Was it a hurricane? Uh, yeah, pr probably. I believe it was hurricane force gusts at least. So yeah, the, a lot of these storms were uh, that I'll speak of are at least gale force and likely uh, or had hurricane force gusts to them, and some of them were even more. So this was a, a tremendous storm, I believe. It was between 80 and 90 mile an hour winds oh. in that storm. Uh, the, uh, the term wash ashore, I'm sure some of you here may, it might apply to some of you, I know it applies to me. Uh, but wash ashores come in all shapes and sizes. And they've been coming here for a long time, not just the pilgrims. Uh, I wrote about this in my previous book, A Brief History of East Ham. There was a fellow named uh, who came uh, ashore in East Ham, John Fulcher. John Fulcher was all 14 years old, mm -hmm. and he was aboard uh, a British brig called the Margaret. He was from Britain. He was a uh, sort of an apprentice on board. He was one of the only survivors oh. of this tragedy. Oh. And as, as a lot of people did during shipwrecks, they would climb into the mast when they hit the sandbar because they'd be getting pounded by waves, and usually this was in the middle of a storm, too. So, and when they hit the sandbar, the ship would start, would start breaking apart. And so you had all this going on. The safest place sometimes was to go up in the mast and hope for the best. Hope somebody comes along and rescues you. Well, that's what happened with uh, young John Fulcher. Freeman Mayo was uh, patrolling the beach after the storm. He was looking, just looking for anybody who may have survived this uh, storm. And he saw this young fellow, and he got out there, rescued him, brought him home. And Fulcher ended up living in East Ham for the rest of his life. Three different families brought him, raised him until he was an adult. And then he 
Ended up becoming a, a U.S. citizen 14 years later. Bought a lot of land in East Ham. He actually owned farmland around Fort Hill. And uh, family members from the Fulchers are still there today. <laughs> Fulchers are still a very active family on the Outer Cape. And uh, a couple of generations in, they would refer to Obed Fulcher, who had a farm there. They would use the old McDonald song to refer to them. Uh, you know, as the old refrain goes, old John Fulcher came ashore, E-I-E-I-O, here a Fulcher, there a Fulcher, everywhere a Fulcher, Fulcher. <laughs> Obed Fulcher had a farm. Another wash ashore, this one was pretty unusual. This was a brig that nobody really knew the name of it. This was in 1854. Was hitting stormy weather off of Truro near Highland Light. And it's trying to get to port, but it's losing control quickly. And things are starting to wash overboard. Well, this, uh, this brig eventually got into Cape Cod Bay, and then the wind drove it right into the rocks it's situated eventually. Seven men died during this, uh, during this uh, tragedy. But at, before the ship rounded the Cape, one of the things that was blown overboard was a big crate with a pig in it. <laughs> the pig was, uh, he somehow got out of the crate in the ocean and swam to shore about a mile. And nobody, I don't usually think of pigs as pretty good swimmers, but they are. And this guy swam a mile to the beach. He was found there out of breath but intact, and one of the locals brought him home. And it was said that uh, he grew to be a big and lusty porker. <laughs> and if he could have talked, they would have known the name of the ship. <laughs> so at that point, in the 1800s and 1700s, the only people that were really in the rescuing business uh, was the Mass Humane Society. They were actually uh, setting up small huts along the outer beach and also, they would, these would be manned with uh, not people so much, it was volunteers. Uh, and they would have a surf boat and maybe some other equipment. But these were the only people that were doing any kind of rescues of uh, people at shipwrecks. And this was becoming a real problem. So in the, after the Civil War, the establishment of the U.S. Life Saving Service came about. And this was an actual government agency. It was actually operated by the Treasury Department. And the Life Saving Service was uh, initially, its first superintendent was a fellow named Sumner Kimball. Kimball was uh, from Maine originally, but he actually did some uh, teaching in Orleans as a young man. So he knew what was going on with the shipwrecks. He had seen some while he was in Orleans. And he was appointed as chief of this Revenue Marine Division in 1871, and that's how the Life Saving Service came, came about. And this guy was really, he's quite the bureaucrat. He, uh, he actually led the U.S. Life Saving Service so far along that it was folded into the U.S. Coast Guard in 1915. And Kimball was the first one to get a pension. So he was really good with the money. In fact, he hired a uh, writer named William O'Connor to write reports. And he O'Connor would just kind of take the reports from the station keepers, eh, maybe beef it up a little, you know, keep the facts the facts, but eh, exaggerate a little bit. And this was great for getting money from Congress. So. He, uh, this, this resulted in uh, the Life Saving Service getting a lot of money to do what they needed to do. Initially, they set up stations all over the eastern seaboard, uh, some along the Pacific, also out in the Great Lakes. There was a need for this, uh, this type of thing. On Cape Cod, there were nine stations initially along the outer beach. Uh, that grew to 13 by the end of the 1800s, very quickly. It started at Wood End, up in Provincetown, uh, all the way around to Race Point. You had the Peacot Hill Bars off of Provincetown, which was one of the most treacherous areas to navigate. Uh, even to this day, it's pretty rough. But uh, Peacot Hill was, was the site of a lot of different uh, wrecks 
And, and you can see on this map, if you can see this map at all, uh, up around Provincetown it's pretty bad, and then again around Monomoy it's, it's even worse. Uh, you also had High Head Station, go down into Truro, you had a couple of more. Pamet uh, Station, which is at Boston Beach, that's a hostel now, uh, that building. Um, in uh, Wellfleet, you had the Cahoons Hollow Station. Anybody know what that is now? The Beachcomber. Right. Beachcomber, nightclub. Uh, go down a little bit further at Nauset, there was a life saving station. Not the one that's there now. That was a Coast Guard station that was built in 1935 to replace the old life saving station. The site of the old life saving station from Nauset is now a couple of hundred yards underwater. Uh, Orleans had one right around that site where uh, the uh, Sparrowhawk wrecked. It was in that area, Pochi Island, they called it. And Old Harbor Station in Chatham uh, was in North Chatham, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, very shortly. And then Chatham had one, and then you had two other stations on Monomoy, which was another tough area. Mm -hmm. So with the life-saving service intact, each station had a keeper, kind of a captain. And then you had anywhere between seven and nine surfmen. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these guys, they worked mostly between August and the following June, and then the summers they kind of had off because there wasn't a lot of need unless there was a hurricane mm -hmm. or something like that. Each night, men like this would be sent out on patrol right about 4.30 or so at night as it was getting dark. One would be sent north, one would be sent south. And they would often meet up with uh, another surfman at these little uh, halfway houses. These are kind of like the old humane society huts. They were in between the stations. So they would, these, these guys would go there, they would kind of meet up with, say, Nauset would go, the guy from Nauset would go north, Cahoon's Hollow would go south, they'd meet up here, uh, they could go in this place, get warm. Uh, and there was also a telephone in there. They actually had wires that ran along the outer beach. And this was pretty efficient. They could phone in, or, you know, if somebody was in trouble. And these tokens, too, they were, they were numbered one through nine. And if you were the number one surfman, you had a lot of experience. If you were the number nine surfman, you were probably fishing last week. <laughs> so the surfman out on patrol, when they see somebody in trouble, they summoned the station. And that's when they broke out what they called the apparatus cart. And the apparatus cart had a surf boat on it. And this is what they would do. They would usually try to uh, get on the surf boat and get to the ship that was in distress. Because this ship offshore could be anywhere from 500 yards to, or not even 500 yards, maybe a few hundred yards. Could also be a mile offshore. But when it's that far off, you're not going to be not, not going to have a great success rate. Anyway, the surf boats were used. If the surf wasn't too too rough, but when they were sighted, the surfmen would light what they called a costume flare. It's kind of like a road flare, and this also this notified the ship that help was on the way if the men were still alive or healthy enough to respond, uh, but also to the station. They had somebody on watch in the tower. And being up in the tower, they could see this. And this is when they sent help out uh, with the apparatus card. Sometimes they also get the surf boat out. They'd have to, uh, <laughs> sometimes they had a horse, sometimes they didn't. The men had to pull it sometimes uh -huh. through the sand. And that sand, if you ever walk the outer beach sand, uh -huh. it's tough. It's very loose. Yeah. It'll work, uh, do, some, do some really rough things to uh, your, your leg muscles if you're not used to it. If they couldn't use the surf boat, this is when they utilized something called the breeches buoy. The breeches buoy was uh, utilized with a small cannon called the Lyle gun. They would fire a projectile. You can see in, maybe in the back of the cannon here, there's a couple of projectiles. Uh, they would put this projectile in the gun, in the, in the cannon, and attach it to a box of rope. And the rope was a good 500 yards long. It could go that far. And it would, they would fire it, get it over the mast. Hopefully somebody on board could fasten it. 
then you create this zip line oh. between oh, the ship and the shore. Okay. And one at a time, these guys on board, if they could, would step into what were like pants on this oh. on this uh, oh hanging from this this uh, zip line thing, and they would get inside these pants and one at a time be uh, wheeled across to safety. Sure. Well. Most of the time it worked. Sometimes it did. Sometimes they were, uh, but the surf boat also. The, the surf sometimes got it so out of hand, uh, it didn't matter. So with uh, people in place, but not all the stations in place yet, at the end of 1872, in Truro and Provincetown, right before Christmas, you had two shipwrecks that happened. One was the Francis. German bark, as they called it, carrying sugar from uh, India, headed for Boston, wrecks on what is now head of the Meadow Beach. And this was uh, the responsibility of the Highland Station in Truro, and that was run by Edwin Worthen. He was the newly appointed uh, keeper. Problem was, Worthen didn't have a station yet. He didn't even have a, have a crew. So Worthen had to go out into town during a snowstorm, recruit volunteers, get them across town to the bayside, where they took an old whaling surf boat off a pond, off a frozen pond, through the snow, back to the Atlantic side, to the beach, and they were able to rescue the entire crew. Oh my God. The only survivor, the only one who didn't make it was the captain. Unfortunately, Captain Wilhelm Kortling uh, was very sick. So uh, he was taken to what is now the Highland House. It was actually a sort of a motel back then. And he died there. Oh. And the, uh, after, after this had happened, Worthen, of course, took it very personally, as a lot of these surfmen and uh, rescuers did. Uh, Worthen tended to this man's grave uh, for the rest of his career. Mm -hmm. That was 30 something years mm -hmm. uh, later on. And Worthen mm -hmm. would continually do it every week. So they, they, they took it to heart. They took all this stuff personally. The oh. remains of the uh, Francis can still be seen at low tide. Oh. Uh, Courtling's, Captain Courtling's grave is actually in the cemetery right across from the Truro Police Station on Route 6 mm -hmm. uh, at the corner of Aldrich Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, the Francis did okay, actually, compared to the Peruvian. That was oh. the other ship that was kind of sailing with it. Oh. Uh, and it, it too was, ca was carrying sugar and crude rubber and block tin to Boston from India. And <coughs> this one wasn't as fortunate. The Peruvian hit the bars off of Pekin Hill in Provincetown. Didn't have a chance. It was a mile offshore. It didn't have a chance. Wow. Everybody died. Twenty-two men, wow. including the captain, Zena Vanna. He was on his final voyage at sea. He was all twenty-eight years old. Oh. He had been at sea since he was a teenager, and he was getting married. Oh. So he promised his fiance this was it. He was. It was going to be oh, his shit. last, um, last voyage. Oh. And she ended up finding out by. Uh, Seeing uh, opened up the daily paper and read in great black cruel headline these words: "Ship Peruvian goes down off Cape Cod, all hands are lost." Oh. The Jason, 1893 in Truro, December. This was near the uh, Pamet River Station. 25 out of 26 men on board the Jason died. This, is, this goes down as one of the more tragic uh, yeah. wrecks. It was carrying, it had actually, was coming from Calcutta, uh, had left the previous February, and was carrying 10,000 bales of jute used to make fabric, and actually survived the cyclone in the Indian Ocean. And there was no hope for anybody on board. Oh. All these men had climbed into the mast, and before the lifesavers could get to them, that was it. They all oh. fell, they fell in, gone. The only one who survived was Samuel Evans. Samuel Evans uh, was swept overboard, and not wearing a lot of clothes either. 
in this cold nor'easter mm -hmm. in December. He's swept overboard, but manages to get a hold of a bale of jute that's floating. He gets washed ashore and rescued oh. by the uh, surfmen. And he was in tough shape, but he survived. And he was sent home to England eventually. And his father writes this letter to the Life Saving Service. Says, it's probable he will again be sailing from England in February. I trust on a more favorable voyage. <laughs> yeah, he did go on another voyage. And he didn't make it home. Oh. Not because of a shipwreck. Oh. He fell out of his bunk and broke his neck. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of you might recognize this building here, the old Harbor Life Saving Station. Now in Provincetown, gorgeous place, it's now a museum. They actually have uh, breaches buoy reenactments there, and life saving surfman reenactments and things like that. Uh, it's a great thing. It used to be in Chatham up until uh, 1977. It was built in uh, following the wreck of the Calvin B. Orcutt. In December of 1896, eight men died. And that's when they knew they needed a... There was no station in that general area. The closest ones were Orleans and Chatham, nine miles in each direction. That was, too, that was deemed to be too far. So with the Orcutt tragedy, they determined, we got to build another station. Uh, 1898, it's done. And this stayed there for quite some time until 1977. When it was built, there was about 600 feet of, uh, of, of sand between the ocean, the worst waves, the high waves, and the uh, front door. By 1977, it was right on the doorstep. That's how much erosion went on over the, over the course of 80 years. And that's when it was moved on Thanksgiving weekend of of uh, 1977, they put it on a barge and moved it up to Provincetown. And it sat in the harbor the whole winter through the blizzard of 78. Uh, the Portland Gale, my next book. <laughs> but I'm not going to go into it now because I think we're going to need it. It claimed um, 458 lives, including 200 aboard the steamer Portland. That was in itself was uh, was quite an ordeal. The Portland was heading up to Maine and Thanksgiving weekend that it was blown out to sea and it went down over Stellwagen Bank. That's a program I also do in its entirety, so um, that will happen at some point in book form. Captain Hollis Blanchard was uh, heading, was <laughs> going against company orders, sailing out that night, mm -hmm. and a lot of bodies ended up washing ashore on the Outer Cape, 38 of them. and. Even they had to, they couldn't even keep them all in the funeral home. They couldn't bury them because all the snow on the ground. Oh. They had to store them in a barn. And they had vessels piling up in Provincetown Harbor as well. The Monomoy disaster of 1902 happened off of Chatham. Monomoy. <coughs> Wadena and Fitzpatrick. Uh, long story short, these two barges were trying to ride out a storm and then they panicked flew the distress flag and for the uh, Coast Guard, the lifesavers to come and get them at the Monomoy station. Well, they did. And, you know, they always said, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. Well, that's what happened here. They didn't come back, almost all of them. Uh, the only survivor was Seth Ellis after a while. They got everybody in the surf boat, but everybody was thrown overboard. On the, on the way back. Only one was left, the surfman, oh. Seth Ellis. And he was rescued by uh, Elmer Mayo, who was uh, aboard one of the other um, barges. Oh. And they ended up doing a, doing a huge fundraiser to uh, $36,000 they raised to uh, help the men who perished in this. A lot of them lived in Harwich and Chatham, oh. uh, and it built houses for the families. Oh. Um, and the William Mack Memorial, Mack was the name of the guy who owned the barges, uh, all the names of the people who perished, that is out by the Chatham Lighthouse. Now, if you ever go there. And I'll jump ahead here now to 1915. Off of uh, Highland Light, 
You had three uh, barges that came ashore. They were cut loose by a tugboat during a storm. And this was the Colerain, the Tunnel Ridge, and the Mannheim were the name of the barges. And they had to fend for themselves, and they ended up washing ashore, and they were all beaten up pretty badly. The Tunnel Ridge and the Colerain were so badly smashed, they weren't worth any effort, really, to refloat them. The Mannheim, they were able to do it. Uh, a year later. The other two, they burned them, set fire to them on the beach, except for a part of the coal rain. They wheeled it up on skids on, on the cliff at Highland up to the golf course there. The deck house became the clubhouse of Highland Links for many years. And it was there, in, I think it's all about the 1950s. Wow. But uh, that was uh, that was an interesting way. That it was a deck house of a barge, complete with pilot house, bridge, and steering wheel. <laughs> the Castagna, 1914, um, stranded in Wellfleet, Italian vessel, carrying a load of guano. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, can't be nice. Uh, and bullhorns. Good stuff. Going to the Bradley Fertilizer Company in Weymouth. And they were coming from South America in December. Well, these guys were not dressed for the weather coming oh. north. Oh. Crossed over the equator, still wearing shorts and yeah. <laughs> short sleeve shirts and everything. And oh, it was not a good scene. They were pounded one storm after another, freezing to death by the time they got up oh. to Cape Cod. And that's when the Castagna hit the our bar in Wellfleet. They were, the rescue attempt was really hard because oh. two stations weren't even able to get on the beach in that area at that point Jeez. because of the high cliffs and everything. Uh, the Cahoons Hollow Station from Wellfleet and also the Nauset Station. And they both were eventually, finally, they couldn't even do the breaches buoy because the men on board were in such bad shape. So they had to wait to do the uh, surf boat. And finally, uh, very instrumental in this rescue were the Collins uh, family. Lewis Collins, who had been a surfman for many years, along with his 17-year-old son, Bernie, who later became a selectman in East Ham. He died around 1981. Uh, but Bernie went with his father on this particular wreck. And he, uh, they both got out there and had to cut men down out of the masts. They were frozen solid. Oh. Bernie talked about one man that fell and his arm broke off because oh. it was so frozen solid. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> but Bernie also uh, had to go over to the wheel box where the first mate was still alive, but his hand was frozen oh. to the spoke. Bernie had to take an axe and chop the spoke to free the guy. And he got him, they finally got him ashore through the surf boat and everything. The guy died. He didn't make it. Oh. Uh, a few other people did. The Collins family, incidentally, uh, Bernie sustained some pretty serious injuries from this. He ended up uh, uh, from the frostbite and everything over many years. Oh. It affected him through his life. Oh. Um, the Collins family also owns Collins Cove. That's if you're going to the rotary there at Orleans and East Ham, mm -hmm. and you're going up to the right there, and you see the town cove, and you see these co uh, cottages and the shucking house down there by the water. That's, that's that family. Uh, they still own it to, to this day. Um, and they're, uh, it's, yeah, they've, they've left quite a, quite a footprint in East Ham. Uh, Bernie also, if you can see on this, he's actually... That's not working. Um, this was Bernie uh, as a little kid going with his father out on the, on the wrecks. The five men from the Castagna were, uh, <clears throat> were lost, including the captain. The captain fell from the mast, hit his head, oh. probably died on impact. Oh. Unfortunately, he was also washed overboard instantly. His body turned up a year and a half later. Oh in Nauset Marsh, 10 miles away, and very well preserved on top of that. Wow. So that just gives you an idea of what the ocean can do. Oh, he must have been buried and then was uh, wow. uncovered after a very long time. Uh, any of the other men that uh, uh, survived were brought to Boston. Some of them had to undergo amputations. 
a uh, very bad scene for everybody involved. But the heroics were there from these two stations. And it's also surviving more wash ashore animals. Uh, there was a canary in a cage in the cabin when they got into the cabin singing. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't make it back to, back to the beach. By the time they got him ashore, he died along the way. Uh, also, a cat uh, who looks kind of like Morris the cat from the yeah. old Nine Lives commercials. But um, he was named Castagna and went to live at the Marconi Wireless Station, which is right where this, this disaster happened. And uh, he's believed to have started a long lineage of stray cats on the outer cave. Henry Beston of the Outermost House fame. I've written about him quite a bit. Uh, he, he had a lot of tie-ins to the uh, men of the Coast Guard in the 1920s in East Ham. Uh, he was very friendly with some of the families. They used to come and visit him there. And he tied in a lot of shipwrecks into the Outermost House. But before that, he had written an article called The Wardens of Cape Cod in 1923, five years before the Outermost House. So he, this is when he started his whole uh, Coast Guard uh, involvement. And a lot of the stories that are in this article turned up in uh, the Outermost House later on. And he also ended up, of course, writing about the Montclair, uh, which lost uh, five men died, were drowned in it, uh, because it was a shorthanded staff at Orleans. There were only three men. And they were in the process of closing it down. And so three men died, uh, five men died, two survived. This was, this, the Montclair was ca coming from Nova Scotia. It was carrying uh, 25,000 bundles of lats, wood. Um, two men survived. Uh, one of them was a fellow named Nathan Banks. Banks, actually. And Bags went home to uh, Nova Scotia afterwards, and many years later, about you know, 19, early 60s, he reads a story about the Cape Cod National Seashore in National Geographic magazine, and there's a picture of the wreck of the Montclair, and kids are jumping off of it. And he, he just looked at it and he said, I've got to go back there. And he did. A few years later, he went to visit it. Did the, um, did the shipwrecks ever have phones, like the telephones? Uh, the or early ones did not, no. They were, this was way before any of that kind of technology happened. Uh, so a lot of it was like 100 years ago. So they weren't able to do that kind of stuff. Their communication was, there wasn't even radar uh, for a lot of these uh, wrecks. Um, uh, yeah? Uh, were all these boats wooden? Most of them were up until uh, the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, you started to see more of them. They were mostly wooden mast, masted ships uh, that I, that I uh, address here in the book. Yeah? Would you explain why there are so many wrecks uh, off uh, the Outer Cape? Uh, that would be uh, before the establishment of the Cape Cod Canal. Uh, because the canal was built in, initially in 1914 uh, by a businessman named August Belmont. And Belmont did not do a very good job maintaining it. He tried to sell it very quickly. And he did. He succeeded. He found a buyer in the U.S. government. Uh, he did not, it was not wide enough. It was not deep enough. And they were also charging tolls for ships to go through. So a lot of ships said, the heck with this, we're going the old way. And they would go around the Cape instead. And that was treacherous, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So they uh, eventually, when the government came in in the 30s, the New Deal and everything, managed to um, widen it, deepen it, and built the bridges. Uh, it's the way it is now. So, it, But uh, before that's when you started to see a big reduction in shipwrecks and in Coast Guard stations, too, along the Outer Cape. Uh, that was just one of the factors. Also, technology was improving as well. So they were able to, there, there weren't as many wrecks going on, so they, they closed a lot of them after that. But beforehand, and there were wrecks in the canal too before, while well, Belmont was operating it. So it wasn't, it wasn't that much of a bargain for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, finishing off with uh, just uh, the Eldia. You might, some of you might remember this in 1984. Uh, this large freighter that got caught up in a storm 
and it just had a heck of a time off of uh, Nauset Beach. And this was at the end of March in 1984. And the Aldea ended up stuck in the sand. And for a while there, it was pretty tough to get a rescue out there. They ended up having to get a Coast Guard helicopter out there, uh, three different halls of people. And on the second hall, they got, I think it was 13 people. It might have been 15. But that was fortunate because the, the third hall, they only had to get a few people off. And that made all the difference, really. Uh, because they had to do this in 60 mile an hour winds oh. and the helicopter was running out of fuel. Oh. So they managed to do it and there were no casualties, oh. amazingly enough. Um, but it was, uh, it was a spectacle for months afterwards, uh, for like two months. They finally managed to move it through some uh, tugboat and uh, mm -hmm. cable marbles and uh, got it to Newport, Rhode Island eventually for repairs and evaluate what to do with it and the uh, but the people that came that following week following weeks actually it was like summertime as far as crowds were it, people were all over the again over the dunes uh, just to see this ship and uh, a lot of other Businesses capitalized. Noel Bile, the old historian in East Ham, he sold, I think, 20,000 postcards. <laughs> and Noel was very proud of that, too. And uh, also uh, a few other things, but I also remember there was the, um, at the Land Ho in Orleans, which is, uh, partially, which is owned by some descendants of Abbott Walker, who was the keeper of Nauset many years ago. And the Land Ho had this special with the clam chowder. They had a little, in, in the clams and the potatoes, they had a little plastic freighter. <laughs> Sold like crazy. And John Murphy said, you know, this whole thing has been great for all of us. He says, except for the poor guy who owns the ship. <laughs> that was it. So, um, yeah, that concludes it. Um, I do have copies of the book here in the back, Shipwrecks of Cape Cod, Stories of Triumph, of Tragedy and Triumph. Um, I have a website, dwcapecod.com. tells you everything I'm doing. I've got a lot of other events going on around here and uh, other areas on the Cape over the next few months. I'm leading uh, also history-themed walks for the Harwich Conservation Trust and East Ham Conservation Foundation out of the Cape Cod National Seashore every Saturday from now through November 27th, no. either the outermost house or shipwrecks and storms and all that fun stuff. So uh, that's all in the back there. Yes, that ship, the widow there, Barry Clifford's boat, the widow, the pirate ship with all the gold. Are there any other pirate ships that have crashed around the Cape besides that one? Uh, Barry, Barry Clifford would know about it probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I purposely stayed away from the widow because of, uh, it's been done. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to really reinvent it, you know, try yeah. to go after it again. I also stayed away from the Pendleton. Uh, but I did go on to a story of another event uh, that Bernie Weber of Pendleton fame was involved in, the Margaret Rose in 1962 off of Provincetown. It was a uh, freighter that... Uh, they ended up having to bring the breeches buoy out of retirement wow. for the very last time. And this was 1962. And where did they get that breeches buoy? It was in storage right here along the Cape Cod Canal in Sandwich uh -huh. at that station. Uh -huh. So there's, uh, you know, that story's in there as well. Yes? What about the Andrea Dory? That was, uh, I, I stayed away from that because it was uh, not so much Cape Cod. It was much further to the south of the Cape. Oh. Uh, Nantucket Sound. Uh, I I tended to stick to um, the outer the outer Cape for the most part. One one wreck that I that I did address was uh, was the Robert E. Lee in uh, off of Plymouth in 1928. Uh, three men, uh, Coast Guard rescuers, died uh, in, in the attempt to. Uh, and this also involved they were from the Menomet Station in. Uh, uh, Plymouth, 
but also this involved men from the Sandwich Station and from Wood End and Provincetown as well. See? So they, they came all the way across the bay to uh, rescue, uh, it was what well was over 100. What was the carrying? I'm sorry? What was it carrying? Uh, people. Oh. It was a steamer. Oh. And, uh, but they managed to rescue everybody aboard. Uh, yeah, in the back. The rescue boats, how many people would they hold? Well, the surf boats, um, they uh, take the wreck of the, um, the Monomoy disaster in 1902 that I mentioned. Uh, you had everybody on board from the station, plus you had, I think it was seven or eight men from the barges. So that that was holding uh, that was holding anywhere between fifteen and twenty people right there. These were good sized boats. Um, Cape Cod Maritime Museum, uh, Maritime Museum in Hyannis has uh, has a restored surf boat that they just finished uh, working on. Um, that that if you ever get a look at that, that'll give you an idea. Yeah. The Mayos that you referred to, mm -hmm. Stormy Mayo is a descendant. <laughs> Very likely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I actually spoke with a, uh, a woman who lives out of state now, um, MJ Mayo Stevenson, who provided me with a lot of photographs. Her, I think, it was her grandfather or great grandfather, born, it was born Mayo, uh, was involved with the stations out there. There were a lot of Mayos. There was one up at the, uh, uh, some of the, I, I want to say the High Head Station also early on, about 100 years ago, maybe over 100 years ago. So there were, qu yeah, quite a few of them. It's like Eldridge. Right. <laughs> there's, right. there's plenty of them, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the uh, Riches Boy reenactment at the yeah. Old Harbor Station. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic reenactment. Have you seen it? Oh, yes. Yeah. They have, are they doing it this summer? That I don't know. Okay. Uh, I know they were... Last I heard, they weren't doing any of the historic uh, type of things, but things are changing quickly, mm -hmm. so uh, it's possible it could happen. Well, two years ago, they weren't doing it, but not because of the pandemic. That wasn't happening yet. You're right. They had lost the guy that was. I, um, I went up that to was that one. to fire the gun, I think. And so yes. They were going to train someone else. So I. It was in August of 2019. I went up to that yeah. and. Uh, they, uh, they, they had mentioned that they couldn't do the wild gun firing because they had to have somebody who is certified to do that. You to get some sort of special certification to do that. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, but it gets rave reviews from everybody who sees it. And, and if you go inside that station, it's just a marvel. You know, you can still see all these old relics that are uh, it's been so nicely restored. Uh, people that are giving all kinds of time to it. You know, you got people like Richard Ryder from East Ham, who's mm -hmm. he's, he's descended from a long line of Coast Guard people. Uh, oh. He works on that, among so many other people mm -hmm. that I can't even begin to think of. Uh, but it's uh, that's that's a that's a must visit, I would say, to people. That the Coast Guard Heritage Museum and uh, Barnstable Village. Uh, there's just there's so many uh, Maritime Museum in Hyannis. It, there's a lot of places keeping this spirit alive. I love seeing it. Yeah. Are you familiar with the book? Uh, it's a novel, Rugged Water by Joseph. Joseph Lincoln. Lincoln. Yes, and it was yeah. made into a movie too, I believe, back in the 1920s huh. or really? 30s. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's a good representation of what the Lifesavers did? I think uh, from what I've read of it, I have not read the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, I did read through some of it, and I, yeah, I thought it was pretty accurate. Yeah. The first half of the book is mostly about the life savings, and then he goes off on the plot with the love story and all that stuff. So you yeah. can skip that if mostly you're interested in the in the life savings. But there, I think there were there were some wrecks that he uh, re, that he used as a basis yeah. for for that. Yeah. So yeah, several of the right. In fact, two of them I think are in my book. Mm -hmm. uh, the Montclair, I think, might have been one. The J.H. Eels, I think, it was an, was another one. Uh, so he kind of, yeah, he he tapped into it pretty well, I thought. Um, anybody else? All right, I will be uh, in the back. You can hit me up for. Thank you. Thank you.